I believe that's a good age because um, years bring more wisdom and, and more knowledge and life experiences that you can then write about in, in songs. Um, and somebody I admire a lot, Leonard Cohen, uh, started music around that age too. Yeah, 33. Yeah, and he's, he's a big influence of mine. And, and I started doing this project like four years ago, so I was like around the same age as Leonard Cohen. I sort of just took my personality and divided it into nine variations of myself. And uh, I literally wear these variations of myself that I call my altars uh, on my sleeve. So I'll, I will dress and I will perform or I'll write songs um, as the various uh, versions of myself, um, my altars. And I believe that everybody's kind of uh, inside of themselves have their own altars, you know, that you show to different sizes of yourself to different people. With Cindy Sherman, I'm, you know, I'm a fan, big fan of her work. And, um, you know, when I started doing my music, I didn't really see that correlation. People have brought that up a lot. And, and it's interesting because, um, yeah, you know, when you see a Cindy Sherman uh, photograph, it's like you're stepping into a totally different world than the, ne the next photograph. And I admire that, how she's created these worlds within one photograph and they, they change from each and you can kind of get lost inside of that image. And, um, you know, somebody like David Bowie too, where it's, he just threw out genre, you know, is he, he floated all over the place uh, through genre and and look and um, and through Prince is probably my biggest influence and through him did I discover David Bowie. Yeah, I mean the most sort of authentic version of myself would be uh, the person who is floating from genre to genre. You know, I'm floating from look to look, you know, I'm always changing up my fashion. I'm always, when I put together a, a playlist of st when I'm streaming music, you know, my playlist will be, you know, anything from psych folk to R&B to soul music to reggae to heavy metal. And so I felt like the most accurate representation of myself is to sort of showcase that uh, on the record. And, and in the modern era with streaming, um, a lot of my peers, a lot of my friends, feel the same way. It's sort of hard to feel like you're one style or you're you're just a heavy metal fan or you're just an R&B fan. Um, with the invention of streaming, you can be a fan of lots of stuff because you can sort of explore, you know, uh, different styles of music with a click of a button. I believe that must have been like some sort of happy accident uh, because I don't listen to I don't listen to a lot of '80s music though I love it whenever I hear it. Um, probably my you know the music that I listen to from the '80s is like Prince and The Cure, um, but I don't have a, a I don't have a super broad language of '80s music, so I think just sort of it was by chance that it sounds sort of like that. You know, mm -hmm. I draw more from like. Um, Scott Walker and Leonard Cohen, Arthur Russell, mm -hmm. Lou Reed. Those are like sort of my inspirations on this record with Prince. <laughs> Very much. I started the record uh, with doing lyrics that were more um, abstract and um, maybe a little bit m more metaphorical uh, lyrics that were like maybe more in line with like Kurt Cobain's style of writing lyrics. Um, and then my producer, Justin Raisin, um, really pushed me to start over on the lyrics and, and be more autobiographical because he felt uh, like my story was something that should be in the songs. Um, what I've gone through as a, as a person, uh, I, that I should come from that place. And I respected that suggestion. Um, and so I rewrote all the lyrics and based upon that. I would say uh, regarding, you know, the conversation of gender fluidity and things like that, like I grew up uh, 
you know, having a hard time. Um, you know, I didn't really have many people to talk to about how I was feeling. I didn't have a lot of, um, you know, idols that I could look to that were open about maybe feeling that way. It was sort of, um, I sort of felt like I was my own desert island, pretty alienated. And as I became more comfortable publicly, um, you know, telling friends and, and family, this is how I felt, I, I, through that, learned that there's probably a lot of other people that feel that same feeling of alienation and, um, and not knowing, you know, who to talk to about it or how to explain it. And, um, and then I started being public about it, you know, on the road and things. And I started meeting people uh, from playing shows that were all ages, people who were, you know, 18 to 20, people that were late 30s to 40s who sort of hid that side of themselves and were happy that I was being open about it. And then that really influenced me to be like, you know, very clear, like that's how I feel uh, in the public eye um, so that if there's other people out there that are sort of confused about that and alienated that maybe they can at least go like, well, hey, you know, I, I feel the same way. I engineered the whole record and mixed it. Um, normally, you know, you would probably hire somebody to do that or whatever. Um, but I, I'm kind of a control freak with regards to sound. Um, so I've, I've collected through the years whenever I get spare money, just, you know, rare instruments, rare recording equipment. I have um, Steve Albini's old eight track MCI tape machine and his old two track MCI that he kept in beautiful condition uh, that I used all over the record. Um, I have a console that was uh, once owned by Robert Altman, the film director, who he mixed some movies on it and things like that. Um, I've got an organ that was owned by Harry Houdini. So I, I, I pretty much, you know, spent all of my money on collecting uh, vintage sounding things because I, I just like the sound of it. It was interesting because my mother would play lots of pop music, so it was, but it was a lot of Prince because she was a huge Prince fan, and um, and she was a huge um, a Aaliyah fan, uh, R&B Aaliyah, and Guns N' Roses. Those were like her three. They're all kind of very different from one another. Um, and then my father was a, a really into jazz, so I would experience sort of jazz and classical music when I'm in the car with him, and then when I'm in the car with my mother, it would be like you know. Prince's Let's Go Crazy into Guns N' Roses' Paradise City. <laughs> All the musicians that contributed to the album were uh, musicians that I highly respected and listened to their music pre-writing the record. So it was um, people like Angel Olsen and, and Kristen Control uh, from the Dum Dum Girls and um, Kim Gordon and... Um, and Marissa Nadler, those, those, those records were sort of circling my, my uh, you know, iPod, because I still have mine, <laughs> constantly whenever I'd be you know, going for a walk or whatever. And so when it came time to the record, uh, Justin Raisin was asking me, hey, you know, it would be great if you had some female vocals surrounding your voice. Um, why don't we reach out to some people that you admire? And so I sort of made him a list. And we didn't, either one of us knew any of them and he just reached out and we were lucky enough to have, you know, them on the record. And, and since people like Angel and Marissa and, and uh, Kristen and all, all, they've all become, we've become all friends. So it's, it was nice to do, you know, discover them through this project and then become friends. Mm -hmm. First album I bought uh, was Siamese Dream, Smashing Pumpkins. <laughs> uh, was probably Nine Inch Nails, The Fragile. <laughs>